Uh, hello, this is Nathaniel Lease, Jojo Holton, and Owen Simmons behind the camera. And today we are interviewing Scott Miller in Milwaukee, Wisconsin on May 11th, 2023. So thank you for being with us here today, Mr. Miller. Uh, as, just as an opening question, where did you grow up? What neighborhood, what town? Well, I first grew up, I started out in uh, Wauwatosa and uh, then I, at age six, moved to Whitefish Bay. And then, if you want 50s and 60s, well, that was like the rest of my life in Whitefish Bay, Got even it. today. Yeah, so what was that move like, moving from Wauwatosa to Whitefish Bay? Do you remember anything from that? Yeah, I do. I, uh, my, of course, I had a group of friends in Wauwatosa and it was hard to leave them. So I had my best friend, Bobby Mischke, who was kind of a uh, good friend, but uh, like probably, he was the same, well, maybe a year older than me, but maybe 10 years older than me in maturity and, <laughs> and smarts. And uh, he, uh, I would have him sleep over like once in a while at, in Whitefish Bay, just getting used to the new, the new digs. Yeah. Um, uh, what was it like switching schools, going from a school in Wauwatosa to school in Whitefish Bay? Well, yeah, I mean, I was in kindergarten, so it was, uh, not a big deal. I, I don't. I don't recall it being that big a deal. You know, I did. I did. I did get friends pretty quickly in Whitefish Bay, and my my <coughs> my mother said that uh, she I, she somehow got a uh, a friend about a block south of us, and uh, um, the the boy down there being my age, his name was David Pemberton, and uh, we called him Pemby. And my mother said, <laughs> now we would all walk to school, and it was about a six block walk. And uh, my mom said every time, she said all you have to do is walk a block and a half straight, and you'll go to Pem Pemby's house, and then he'll, he'll help you go to get to school. And uh, she said she prayed every time I left the house that I'd make it to school. <laughs> but all I had to do was get to Pemby's house. And I, I you know, it was no problem. Once, once I got to, uh, to Pemby's house, the first couple of times I knew my way to school anyway. It wasn't any big deal. Well, I guess going off the topic of schools, uh, you mentioned in the pre-interview uh, atomic bomb drills. What were those like? Oh, that was that was fun. We had a great time. I mean, <coughs> the uh, they would. Uh, I don't recall. There must have been like the regular bell in the school would would ring, and uh, the teachers would, would pull these black shades down to, to, uh, in the windows, and then we were all instructed to go to the basement, and uh, the, the hallways in the basement is where we were supposed to go. So everybody, all the students would go down to the basement, and uh, at first, you know, we were like whispering and talking and whatever, and we're supposed to be real quiet. Why, you know, I mean, atomic bomb. <laughs> but shh, be quiet. So we'd go down there and then, you know, we'd get all huddled down and, <laughs> and uh, then uh, be quiet and then uh, that was it. You know, all of a sudden they'd ring the bells again and then we'd go back to our classrooms and the shades would go back up. Well, <clears throat> You know, obviously, all of what we know today 
if an atomic bomb hit, that would be it. Uh, forget it. But we weren't worried really about. It was it was a kind of a break in the day, and it, it, they only occurred. They weren't even once a month. They were like once in the fall and once in the spring or something like that. It was just, hey, it's an, an atomic bomb drill. Right. But so, ahead, yeah. I don't know. You want me to expound on the atomic stuff? Sure. Yeah. Or were you going to ask questions on that? Well, I was just going to ask if it was a. Uh, so it wasn't so much you. Those drills wouldn't make you feel in danger or anything like that. No. Or just a, they didn't. They did not. So that was one of my questions. Is you mentioned on the sheets that you wrote that you had um, followed shelters? Did you have, know anyone that had a followed shelter, like in their backyard? Yes. Well, that was really cool because we treated those like forts, underground forts, and we did not know. I did not know anybody who had one in the backyard, but there were, <clears throat> you know, in some of our. Uh, bo little boy magazines or whatever, they had like, this is how you build a fallout shelter type of things, you know. And even like popular mechanics and stuff like that. And we go, wow, that's really cool, you know. <clears throat> but I did have Pemby, my friend Pemby, he had an uncle and it was out in the um, uh, Holy Hill area that his uncle had a farm. And once in a while, we'd go out there and, and just to have a good time and spend the uh, weekend out there. He'd invite me. Well, his uncle had a fallout shelter, and it was really cool. You'd go into this, it's this all brick, you know, cement block thing, and all this canned food and, you know, beds in it, and these air purifier things, and, you know, the, steel door and we'd, we'd go in there and we'd just like play fallout shelter <laughs> and it, it was just for us it was a, a game but as i got older i thought uh i mean and i'm talking about like the the 70s the 80s i thought you know that whole th era was a real scam because the Russians, when you looked at the Russians' equipment, no way was it that accurate that they were going to drop a bomb in Milwaukee. Their bombs were going to hit all the people who escaped out of Milwaukee, you know, 50 miles, 100 miles out of town. Their bombs were going to miss and they were going to hit those people. And, Mo and people that were in Milwaukee were going to be safe because they, they had the worst equipment that, that there was. But it was all, you know, oh, it's going to hit the center of Milwaukee and everything's... So anyway, it didn't matter. We, 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 but we would find, we would see in buildings in Milwaukee, they, they called it civil defense. I don't know if you've ever seen those things. There was, <coughs> uh, there were these green cardboard, uh, it was, they were painted green uh, with yellow markings and it and it would say CD on it and they were called civil defense and <clears throat> they would have be in the basement of all these buildings and that's was supposed to be you know if the sirens and these were the regular sirens like you hear now the 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 same sirens that you hear for a tornado those were the civil defense sirens for if there was a going to be an atomic uh, bomb coming and uh, they'd play them on Wednesday like they still do at noon and <clears throat> uh, so the, the uh, uh, you'd, you'd see in the basement there would be these big drums about this big around and about that high and some of them would be they'd say like water or they'd say like food or they'd, there'd be blankets or whatever it would be in them and they'd be in the basement of big buildings downtown or apartments or something like that. When we got married, um, when I got married, 
we had an apartment and I and this was in the early 70s and we weren't worried about much then and and this the worry about uh, the atomic there still was the concern but we were less worried about an atomic war and we went down I went down in the basement of our apartment and I looked at it holy man this is really cool you know look at all these civil defense stuff you know but at that point, too, I thought, again, it's useless because if the bomb hits, we're going to be evaporated. So. So you mentioned downtown, and uh, could you tell us more about the Nike anti-aircraft buses? That yeah, was yeah, that was cool. Um, along the lakefront, where where uh, Summerfest is. There was a Nike base, and you could see the launch uh, launchers and uh, the, the rockets, the missiles, and <clears throat> um, on uh, Silver Spring at about 50, well, where that um, uh, Army Reserve base is, there was, uh, that was a Nike base too, and they had, um, they had a, radar tower there, and they had the, the uh, launchers there also. And then on, uh, I believe there was one on Brown Deer Road, uh, <coughs> just off, uh, well, it wasn't I-43 back then, but just to the west of I-43, there was another Nike launch site with another radar site. And they had them in Menominee Falls, and they had them in, in uh, all over the place. They had them in, uh, and we, we just would go by it. Wow, look at that, you know. We're protected. We got Nikes. So Nikes to us weren't shoes. <laughs> they were missiles. Anti they, they were more anti-aircraft. They weren't going to shoot down a, a rocket, or a, you know, a, a, a rocket, but they were going to shoot down a bomber. Um, so, uh, speaking of just the general threat during the 50s and 60s, did you fear the Soviet Union? And what was the general uh, feeling of people your age at the time about them? Yeah, but we were more interested in playing you know, with our buddies, and which was nice. Yeah. Our, our parents were pretty good about it. They, they didn't like put the fear of God in us about the Russians and the Soviet Union. We, we call them Russians. We didn't call them the Soviet Union. <clears throat> in fact, um, I, I, you know, when the Cuban Missile Crisis came up, yeah, it was on TV. It was, you know, okay, it was on a lot, but I didn't know how, how close, I had so much confidence in our armed forces, I just didn't know that it was that much of a crisis. So, I mean, it seemed like our Navy was like holding the, the line on anything getting into Cuba and well, they, oh, there's, there's missiles in Cuba, and they're 90 miles away from, from uh, Florida and that kind of thing. Well, I didn't know if they were or they weren't, but. Right. Uh, so did anything ever challenge that, the belief of American strength, such as the Sputnik satellites? Was there ever fear about that? <laughs> but no, that was kind of funny for a kid because as soon as Sputnik came, uh, they, they, some entrepreneur came up with Sputnik bubblegum. <laughs> so we all went to the store and we're, oh, Sputnik bubblegum, this is great, you know, and we were buying the Sputnik bubblegum, which was no different than any other gum, except it was blue and had like sugar coating on the outside, little sugar sparkles. And it was a little round thing, like the Sputnik. 
And we thought, you know, and they said we're behind in the space race and they were all, but as a kid, you're, again, you're, you're more concerned about playing baseball with your friends and basketball and football and that kind of thing. And again, our parents weren't like, ooh, we're, you, you gotta worry about all this stuff. And they weren't. Maybe my parents were worried about it, but we, they, didn't, they didn't show that fear to us. You know, they might have talked about it at the water cooler at, at work, but they weren't bringing it home and saying, oh man, I'm so worried about this whole thing. And uh, so stepping away from the Cold War, uh, was there anything else you were uh, afraid of or any other threats at the time, such as polio? Was that a big deal during? That was huge. That was huge um, because that was on TV. Uh, that, but it was different than uh, COVID. When I, when I, you know, when first COVID first came in, it made me, it brought back polio. And uh, I, my cousin, which I didn't even know this happened because it was back in the time when I was like, a baby and unknowing, but my my cousin, as a little girl, got polio and fortunately survived it. But the family was very uh, traumatized by it, and the only thing that happened to her was that uh, apparently one of her legs was just slightly smaller in diameter than the other leg, and I couldn't really tell, and I learned about this later on in life, that she got polio. But I, what I heard the stories, you know, of the care that they took, they just, you know, she was bedridden and they would um, do everything they could. They put all kinds of compresses on her leg and they did all kinds of things. And now polio, took over the body of other people, you know, completely took over the body and they had, some people had to go in these iron lungs and uh, that was very traumatic. And they had these things, these telethons on TV to raise money for these iron lungs and um, I didn't even know what that was except for it was this tube that apparently was a vacuum thing and it would help you know, br the people breathe. But the problem with that was once, you know, they got to that state, it was like a, they were sentenced for life to be in that iron lung. And all they had was their head sticking out of the iron lung. And it's, it was kind of a sad state of affairs for those people. And some of those people were there for decades and decades in these iron lungs. But uh, we were so unbelievably thankful to God that, and, and uh, Jonas Salk for coming up with the, the vaccine. It was just amazing when, when they, they came up with the polio vaccine. It was, it was just, the most wonderful thing in the world. And we all lined up <laughs> at school and we all got our polio shots, you know, men, men w parents and everybody. And it was, uh, it was just wonderful. And then, uh, then they came, the second, that was the first course. And then the second course was, a, was an oral thing. You, you, that was, uh, developed by a guy, Dr. Sabin, and uh, that was better because he didn't get the shot in the arm, you know, but anyway, it was uh, uh, the two courses were, were, were all you needed and you were protected for life, but I knew kids, you'd see kids uh, that had crutches for, for life, you know, they had crippled legs and other deals, and it was it was sad. It was tough, and there were there were obviously fatalities. I didn't 
I didn't know of anybody who died, but during that time, the one thing I do remember is uh, it, it was worse apparently in the summer and they wouldn't let, they closed swimming pools. So there was just something about, maybe it was just, but you could go to school, you know, it wasn't like you couldn't go to school. It wasn't like the COVID thing and that were, I mean, you could go to school and, um, but I think they quarantined families that were, were, the, were the, there was somebody that had polio, then they would quarantine that family, but they wouldn't quarantine anybody if you didn't have polio. So um, <clears throat> you're mentioning that the COVID reminded you of the polio. Uh, were there any similarities when COVID came around and polio back then? Well, I think because it was uh, an epidemic, you know, and it would it covered, you know, it was it was a it was polio ran in in uh, waves in the world at the time, you know, it would come and then it would subside and then it would come again, and it, this was over decades too, but in the fifties really came uh, hard and um, he, we had better communications with television and things like that, that all of a sudden everybody knew more about it. You know, it just was, once you have like, like with COVID, once you have this communication, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, wow. This is really something, and and then you start seeing other people around you that, that get it, and when you get this communication pipeline, just like with a COVID, you get more. There's more communication today. It's it it has more of a psychological effect on you too, and and uh, so uh, that has some bearing on. Um, what's going on, um, but as I say, it was it was a worldwide epidemic. We were able to conquer it, United States, uh, and it's pretty much conquered through the whole world now. I mean, we with all the with the medication developed, uh, they have conquered it in the world, it comes up every once in a while, but uh, it's so tamped down that it's, it's really, the, I think they considered it pretty well uh, conquered. That's very interesting. Uh, I, again, in the pre-interview, you mentioned iodine tablets. Uh, did you ever have to take those, and were you aware of their purpose? Oh, the iodine tablets. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, uh, right after, you know, the atomic bomb started uh, with, uh, they started, they were doing the, after the bomb Japan, and there was all this testing going on, and it was above ground testing. Well, the United States decided we can't do all this above ground testing because of, we're, we're getting all this nuclear uh, stuff in the, in the atmosphere. And if we do it down in, in um, New Mexico or, you know, in the desert down there or something like that, or Arizona or, you know, even in the deserts, it's gonna blow across the country and there's still gonna be fallout and it's gonna get in, it's gonna get in our food supply in the Midwest, you know, and the corn and the wheat and whatever. It's gonna just be a bad thing for the country. And I think they saw that some of the radiation was, levels were getting higher. So they, decide, they decided to do underground testing. Well, the Ruskies, you know, as backward and stupid as they are, they still were doing above ground testing. And, <clears throat> That was the problem that they were doing above ground testing. And so when they were doing the above ground testing and uh, 
we would know and we would have to if we knew that some radiation was coming in our direction in the United States, we'd have to take these iodine tablets for our thyroids. And <clears throat> so that's, that's, the school kids were all given, you know, okay, you know, you're gonna have to take these iodine tablets and it was for your thyroid. Yeah, um, could you, what, could you define what, what a, a Ruski? Russian. Ah, Russian. Okay, thank you. So, <laughs> there many it's a slang, slang term for a Russian. Okay. Oh, well. You're not a Ruski, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, you're good. Were there a lot of nicknames like that that you guys used to define the Russians or the communists? Uh, yeah, well, they probably all come up. I don't know. Yeah. In the uh, pre-interview, you mentioned that you were one of the first people to go on uh, an airplane, and you took a trip down to. Well, I wasn't one of. I was one of the first ones to be on a passenger jet. Passenger jet. Yeah. Can yes. you describe what that experience was like? Well, it was a lot of fun. You know, I mean, my my dad uh, <coughs> said uh, we're going to go to. Di he he was doing a business trip, and he said. Uh, how would you like to go on a, on a jet airplane and we're gonna go to California, we're gonna go to Disneyland and uh, I said, great, yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. I had already been on you know, the regular propeller planes and the propeller planes, I'd always get sick, always, because they couldn't, they weren't flying high enough and they'd get in the clouds and they'd go up and down and up and down and I just, it wasn't for me. but. So our, our, flam our family would fly to Florida visiting my grandparents and we'd fly in these DC-7s. And but anyway, so it was uh, probably a year and a half or so into the 707s, Boeing 707s. And so he said, yeah, we're gonna fly to California and we're gonna take a jet. And they said, wow, that's cool because the jet age, you know, that was, that was really something. <coughs> Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, we took a, a jet to uh, California and it was like smooth flight. It got up above the clouds and I don't know if it was like 33,000 feet or something like that. It, they, they flew a little higher than they do now <clears throat> and uh, just really uh, was a nice flight and I really liked it. You, they didn't have to like, the old piston uh, propeller jobs, you'd get out on, a, on the uh, ready, you know, going to, to take off and you were out on a tarmac and it took, took them, I don't know how long to, to warm up their engines. They'd sit out there and they'd be revving up those engines and warming them up and warming them up and then it would take forever. And then finally they'd turn to the runway and then they'd go and take off. But a jet, man, that thing, you know, was ready to go almost right away. Click that engine on, you know, back up and go and get out of there and whoosh, up he went. So that was, a, that was nice, you know. What would you do for entertainment on longer flights, obviously before uh, a lot of technology? What do I, what do I, what I do on a, on a flight? Yeah. Just to pass the time. Well, I was always looking out the window. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't. We didn't have, you know, in those days, you didn't have the, the all the different things. You didn't. It, it was a long time before you had uh, any kind of entertainment. My first flight that even had a movie. Now, get this. I don't even know if you'll even think about this. But if you can, they had like a movie screen that they pulled down and it was a jet. We were going to Mexico and I was 13. Well, yeah, this was in the, this was in the 60s. So it's in this time. So we went, I was 13 in 1963 and my parents took me down on a business trip again with my dad and my mom. <coughs> and uh, so we're going down to uh, Mexico, and it was uh, a cowboy movie. 
and uh, a Western. And <coughs> they say, well, the movie today is going to be whatever it was. And so they, at the way front of the cabin, they pull down this movie screen, and we think this is great. We're going to get a movie. And down it goes the movie screen. And then they got the projector way back here, and they show, they show a movie. And that was, that was what it was like. That's, that's, we thought this was great. Otherwise, what they had was, you know, they'd pass around the food, they had the drink carts, they had the soda carts, you know, the pretzels, the peanuts. That was the big thing. Or you could bring your own magazine. Oh, they had magazines too, but that's, that was about, or your own book. But they, we, they didn't have anything they got like today. I remember when they first had, like, on the back of the seat in front of you, they had a phone that you, like, and then you dial. You know what a dial is? <laughs> or a push button, or maybe it was a push button. It might have been a push button thing. Anyway, and that cost an arm and a leg. You're up in the air, you know, you're on the, the time of the airlines, and you're, and you're their captive. Boy, they want to charge you an arm and a leg for calling Grandma. Hey, hey Grandma, we're going to be landed. Tell Grandpa we're going to be landed in uh, 15 minutes. Well, you, uh, you mentioned the movie, and that just got me wondering, what, were, what was the big genre of movies back when you were younger, back in the 50s? Well, it was mostly the Westerns, mostly. And then there was some, uh, you know, cops and robbers type things. That, uh, that was about it. Um, well, I guess moving on to... Uh, oh, there were, no, I, there, there were war movies too. John Wayne, you know, and he was in Cowboys and he was in... Uh, War movies, two World War II type movies, yeah. Yeah. So, do you remember uh, where you were when the Apollo uh, Apollo Eleven mission launched and was going to the moon and then landed? Yeah. What I, those days were like? I was I was up in uh, with your grandmother, up in uh, she was only high school. <laughs> she wasn't. We weren't married yet. So I was, we were up at uh, Crystal Lake, up near Elkhart Lake, and uh, um, staying with friends. The friend had, um, her parents had a house and a bunkhouse. And my Vietnam buddy, had, was, had his, his future wife and your grandmother stayed in the house and we stayed in the bunkhouse. <coughs> and uh, the father of uh, this guy's uh, girlfriend um, was watching the TV and watching the uh, lunar landing. We thought, wow, wow, look at that, you know. And so we watched Neil Armstrong and it was cool. Buzz Aldrin. Were there any big celebrations, uh, either back home or where you guys were? Or was it more just amongst you, uh, the people yeah. you had, you were with? Just the people we were with, yeah. Um, well, you mentioned the Vietnam friend, so I guess we could move over to Vietnam. Uh, what was that like? What was the, uh, how old were you when it started, and uh, what was the general feeling? How like? old was I when it started? Well, it started in, uh, when Eisenhower sent like Green Berets over there, advisors. Um, <clears throat> after the French left, huh? Yep. 
Yeah. What was the what was the feeling of Whitefish Bay or your neighborhood and your friends about the Vietnam War? <coughs> well, it was pretty. I don't know. It was pretty. Um, here's the pictures I wanted to show you. Here's the one. I don't know what you want to do. I can. Uh, if you could hold them up to the camera, yeah, that'd be I really can cool. Maybe can also zoom in. I don't know. Can you see him? That's the one guy. I mean, that's that's him, and uh, here he is. Radio, oh, yeah. radioing in. He was like the radio guy. Uh, I didn't think I didn't <laughs> think that was a good idea for him to go, but. Early on, it was kind of, we were kind of um, on the gung-ho side. But my dad was like, my dad's attitude, he was a World War II vet. And his attitude was, and, and my uncle, my dad's brother, was a World War II vet. And my dad's attitude was, there's been enough Millers fighting in wars, there's not gonna be any more Millers fighting in wars. But he, what he didn't like about Vietnam was there was no uh, end, end game, there was no purpose, there was no, we're not, we're not, what are we fighting, you know? In World War II, there was a, there was a purpose of, we're defeating, we're gonna defeat the Japanese and the Germans. Now my dad fought both in the Pacific initially and then in, in Italy. To fight. He fought the Germans, so he fought the Japanese and he fought the Germans. And <clears throat> so that was essentially the last war we fought that had, we're gonna win this war. Korea, we still haven't finished Korea. It's just a truce. In uh, Vietnam, we didn't win. Even though we beat the hell out of them, we didn't win. Um, and any other war we've pl uh, fought since then, there's been no real end game. We, we completely lost the idea of what, why we would go to war. You know, you either go to war our opponents know why they're going to war. Our opponents go to war for a, a stated purpose. They're going to win. And if they're going to fight a, an, a, another opponent who is not really in there to win, they're, they are going to win. So th that's what you guys have to understand when you're you're at that age um, <clears throat> because that's why with these poor guys that went to Vietnam, they would take a hill in Vietnam and then they'd have, they would be told to, to come back to the base. Robotics, your food has been delivered to the Hanky Center. Robotics. So essentially, so essentially they'd give up ground. In World War II, they'd take ground, they'd keep that ground. They'd take more ground, they'd keep that ground. They'd take more ground, they'd keep that ground. I mean, it wasn't just take the ground and, and pull back, take the ground and pull back and retake it. That's what, that's what Vietnam was all about. It, it, so essentially you're losing all these uh, troops and you're not, you're not getting in all these good, good young men and, and for what? That's, what? that's what happened to these poor guys there. It sounds like um, you, did, 
Did you ever protest against the war? I did not. No. Did no. you know anyone that did? Were there major protests uh, in Milwaukee that you heard about? Yes, there were major protests in Milwaukee. There were major protests on my college campus. I knew guy. I had a high. Uh, I didn't develop this attitude until later on, when I saw my buddy come home. But there, and and then I re, I kind of realized when I talked to some of these vets, uh, there were major uh, <clears throat> I, I, there were guys that came back uh, to college you know and went to college and they were very you know kept kept to themselves there were a lot of stories I learned later on about the way they were treated when they landed on the ground and California and how they were treated by the war protesters that I never knew about. You know, that they were spit on and they were called baby killers and all that kind of thing, which I never knew about until later on. But uh, so I, there are a lot of things I didn't agree about with the protesters. Uh, and the way they went about things. But I think a, a, a lot of the problem was that the politicians uh, this was a political war, Vietnam was a political war. A lot of these political wars you got to be careful with. And I'm con very concerned about Ukraine, very concerned, because it's all hyped up, and I'm concerned about you boys with Ukraine. It's, it's not the United States fight. So be very careful, you know. Don't let the politicians talk you into anything because they're not going to send their kids and they're not going to fight it. Right. Uh, if we could go back to the pictures that you showed us earlier. Uh, who was um, he, uh, the man in the photos that you showed us in relation to you? And what was his, his, his name is, was Craig Robertson. He just recently passed away. And what was uh, his experience coming, th coming back to America after the war, if you knew about that? Did he, well, he didn't talk much about it. In fact, he, he, he was, uh, uh, he got married, we were good friends before he went, we were good friends after. And then uh, he divorced his wife and uh, in our, his wife and my wife and we were, the four of us were all good close friends and then he all of a sudden kind of didn't talk or he wasn't you know he he went into a shell and I I didn't I I didn't talk to him for years and years after that, and that probably goes from, he came back in uh, uh, 19, late 1970s, or 1970, 70, early 1971, and we were buddies probably through 74, 75, and then uh, I only saw him twice after that and hadn't talked to him. He was different, quite different, very uh, not at ease at all in the two meetings that I had had after that and then 
there was, uh, he didn't want to see anybody, any of his old friends or anybody uh, after, you know, he, and then like I say, he recently passed away. So he's, he was 72 when he passed away. And he never discussed what went on or his experiences in the war. He kept that all to himself. He did a little bit, but he, I don't know that he discussed the bad parts, you know. You, uh, what his would actually, you know, his, his there there was a, 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 a his good friends then became his his war buddies, oh, see. Right. which um, you know I can understand. Yeah. Uh, so going back to your college years, uh, where did you attend college? I started out at a school called Cornell College. It's a small school in Iowa. And then I transferred to Miami, Ohio. Got it. And you mentioned but that's in the 70s. Right. So now we're getting out of the... Yeah, that's, um, but you mentioned the, uh, the anti-war protests. What were those like? Were they violent or were they civil? I don't think that uh, there was much civility in any of these anti-war protests. And I think there was uh, definitely an element that was injected into them that intentionally made them violent. There were people that were brought in much like Antifa comes into uh, protests and makes today's protests violent. So I, I think there's there's uh, what was in those days. I think there would have been more civil protests. Yeah. Uh, well, while we're on the topic of protests, what was your experience with the uh, with the civil rights movement? Was that a major? Were there major civil rights events that happened uh, that you uh, experienced firsthand? Well, um, there are, I do remember vividly the riots of 68 in Milwaukee. And there were, your grandmother remembers tanks in Whitefish Bay. Um, I remember Whitefish Bay was pretty cordoned off. I think most of the city uh, suburbs were, were cordoned off. There were Fortunately, only three people killed in uh, the riots in Milwaukee, and uh, the mayor, Mayor Meyer, and um, uh, the chief of police and the governor um, called in the National Guard right away. It was a very fast, good move. And I think that's why there was not a lot of damage and not a, and not a lot of loss of life. Sure. I mean, it was immediately, they, they brought these, uh, uh, the riots, uh, tamped down the riots immediately. And um, <coughs> I think there was also an element of, you know, some, outside influence there too, but they, they did the right thing. They brought, they brought in, uh, they met it with a st strong uh, force and, and uh, tamped it down and uh, that was a good thing. Um, 
What I will say is uh, in, in retrospect, um, Milwaukee was a, you know, there was a, there was a great industrial uh, move of black people, as we all know, from the South, moving up to the northern cities for jobs. Um, I'm sure you've learned that in history. And <clears throat> uh, I even know it from uh, my generation. I owned a steel business for four, over 40 years, and uh, I had uh, black guys in my company that uh, were born in Mississippi, Arkansas, and good guys. And uh, <clears throat> we trained them to weld and trained them to run burning machines and all kinds of stuff, you know. So it continued more than just, you know, these, these were the sons of the parents that had come up. And <clears throat> Um, but what, what changed in the 60s, there was, um, there were great companies back in the 50s and 60s, really great companies um, in Milwaukee, manufacturing companies. Uh, company, all A.O. Smith, Alice Chalmers, all these, uh, all through the Menominee River Valley, you know where the Menominee River Valley is? That was all industrial, huge industrial. And uh, do you know where A.O. Smith was? It was on 35th and Capitol Drive, huge complex. But not only was A.O. Smith there, but there were, it was called the Northwest Corridor. That was the Northwest part of Milwaukee. Now the Northwest part is way out in uh, the Brown Deer area. There was a lot of industry out there in the Brown Deer area, but uh, the government in all its wisdom and the politicians and all their wisdom um, enacted things that um, really hurt families and really hurt jobs and uh, really hurt industry. And it was, it was the start of uh, moving industries and, and killing these industries. And uh, one of them was uh, uh, the Great Society. And I think that th there were, th these companies uh, supplied more, f more than family supporting jobs. There was these jobs were very, very good and very, very good paying jobs. And they, uh, then you had the OSHA law, which in my mind went, there may have been some need for some of it. It's now a book like this and not only do you have the people who administer this agency don't even know what's in that book. And if somebody gets ser seriously hurt, uh, there's 10 attorneys 
coming after you too. So what's the point of having an agency when you got 10 attorneys coming after you? I can tell you from my own experience in business, businesses are very careful to run safe operations. The only, the only, uh, the, when they are, are not, the only people that don't run safe operations are some small, you know, dinky little one or two man operation that doesn't fall under the law anyway. I mean, they, they, they don't apply, you know, they, these OSHA laws don't apply to them. And the EEOC was a, somebody could say whatever they wanted to. They could say, you're discriminating against me. I had people say I discriminated against them. And I had, would have three or four black guys on my side of the table. And this was just one guy saying, you're discriminating against me. I'd win the case, but it would cost me $5,000 to defend my side of the argument. So it, it costs a lot of money when the government says, you know, you're, gonna, you're going to uh, abide by all these laws and we, we abide, we're abiding by the laws. And this is what, when c companies are faced with this thing, they say, well, why don't we go somewhere else? Why don't we go offshore then? We don't have to put up with this crap. We're gonna go to somewhere where, where we're not hassled by these people. We're gonna go to where we can do this and do that and we don't have to, and then they do. And then what do you got? You have no jobs. Milwaukee used to have, I can't count, I could count at least 20 foundries. Foundry jobs, are wonderful paying jobs. And they said, well, foundry jobs are polluting. And foundry jobs are dangerous. Well, I didn't hear anybody say in the 1950s that the 1950s, the temperature of the air was too hot. He said it was too cold. And, but we had family supporting jobs for these people and now we don't have them. Well, you know what we have? They put in strip malls and, and uh, minimum wage jobs, no benefits. So what's so good about that? Anyway, what's your next question? Well, uh, I guess we could move on to a, a lighter topic. Uh, what were the what were the sports teams like back in the fifties and sixties? The Brewers, Packers, um, back in the day. Well, the Brewers, or no, it was the Braves. The Braves. Nineteen fifty-seven. That's when I first got into baseball. I love the Braves. They won the World Series. And uh, they had a great group of hitters, pitchers. Uh, they had the best. They had this guy. Anybody know Eddie Matthews? Well, he's a Hall of Famer, played third base. He was, uh, he and Henry Aaron led the league together with home runs. You know Henry Aaron? I think so. Yeah. You think so? Henry Aaron 
really is the home run king. It's not Bonds, it's Henry Aaron, because Henry Aaron did it without steroids. <laughs> Henry Aaron hit, what, 758 home runs or something like that? He was the first guy to hit, the beat Babe Ruth. You know who Babe Ruth is? Right, yeah. Well, Henry Aaron came out of the Milwaukee Braves organization and then they moved to Atlanta. Oh, yeah, right. During that time, uh, what was Hank Aaron? When, was he, when did he get into the Braves? Was that before? Well, he started out in the minor leagues at uh, Eau Claire. Played in the minor leagues up at Eau Claire, and then uh, I think it was only a year, and then he came down to Milwaukee. How often would you go to uh, the Braves games? Was that a regular thing for you and your family, or was it more of a special event to get to go to them? For the Braves? Yeah, and then on to the into the Brewers. Oh, uh, the Braves. I uh, I'd get to about five or six games a year. My grandfather had season tickets, but he'd go to most of them. Yeah. And then what about the Brewers uh, when, they, when they became the Milwaukee team? Um, yeah, they were so bad the first like 10 years. I was probably going to three or four games. <laughs> but I was, you know, at first, they started in 1970, I think. What's up? Oh, I was, we were just gonna ask like the uh, public opinion and like how big they were, the Braves were, and the Brewers were culturally back when you were in the 50s and 60s. Braves were huge. I mean, we were starving for a, for a baseball team in uh, the 50s. And they built County Stadium, which was the first stadium, on speculation in hopes to get a major league team. So they built this stadium and <coughs> they coaxed the Boston Braves to move to Milwaukee. And that uh, then that was like 1953 was their first year, and they were they were good when they came to Milwaukee, right away, right out of the box. We had a Hall of Fame pitcher in Warren Spahn. He came. He was the best left-handed pitcher at the time he, that that there ever was. He won. He had 13 20-game win seasons in his career. He hit like, I don't know, something like 45 home runs in his career. He was just this unbelievably great uh, guy. And uh, he, uh, he was the ace. And then they had another guy, Lou Burdett, who was the number two pitcher. And then they had all these other pitchers, they had to Bob Buell, that, that was the top three. Bob Buell, Lou Burdett, and Warren Spahn were the top three pitchers. <coughs> and then, uh, then they had Henry Aaron and uh, Eddie Matthews. What was the reaction, or what was your reaction to when- You got it? Yeah. What was my? Yeah, what was your reaction when the Braves left Milwaukee, was that? Well, really, I, I got to see the last game they were here, and there was probably a thousand people at the stadium. It was it was sad because we really loved our Braves. The, 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 the Milwaukee, there were a lot of Cubs fans in Milwaukee, but they also had a team called a minor league team, Triple A, called the Brewers here. And <clears throat> so they, uh, but they wanted, you know, they wanted to have a major league team and then they, they got the Braves and the Braves, so 50, 
three, they came. And then by 57, they win the World Series against the Yankees, the New York Yankees. And Casey Stengel was the manager of the New York Yankees, and he's like this total baseball legend. And he made the mistake of calling uh, the Milwaukee Brewers Bush League. So when he called them Bush League, oh, that really got in our craw. And so then we beat them in seven games, you know, four out of seven in the World Series. So then in 58, we get to the World Series against the Yankees again. And we lose uh, in seven games to the Yankees. But we were always right up there, you know, challenging for getting into the World Series. And there, were only, there was only an American and National League at the time, there was in all these divisions, so you had to win in the National League pennant or the American League pennant, and you know, if you weren't, if you didn't win those pennants, you were out of luck. And the Brewers, yeah. I got to see the World Series with the Brewers. Really? That was fun. Was that held here in Milwaukee or was that somewhere else? Well, it's a seven game series. Oh, right. So we had three games in Milwaukee. There were f four in St. Louis. There was two in St. Louis, three in Milwaukee, two in St. Louis. Yeah. That must have been a, quite an experience. I'm sure there were a lot of people there as well. Yeah, there were. I mean, it was a sellout. The Brewers were up three to two, go to St. Louis. All I had to do was win one. Couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, well, uh, moving on. Packers. Yeah, the Packers. 1960. They had Lombardi. He was a young coach. I think it was his second year as coach. That's when I first got into life. I didn't know of him until 1960, so it was their second year. And my dad and I were watching him on TV, and we watched the, the championship game in 1960, and the Packers were ahead most of the game, and then at the very end, the Eagles get ahead. And then the Packers are driving down at the end of the game, and they are like, I don't know what they were, on the 20-yard line of the Eagles. And something happened, and they run out of time. But they had the best quarterback the Packers ever had. They had Bart Starr. He won five championships. And he called all the plays. Bart Starr called all the plays. He didn't have, you know, they, didn't, they weren't, once in a while they'd bring in a play, but other than that it was always Bart Starr calling all the plays. Yeah. Well, that's great information on the sports team. Uh, so what about uh, when John F. Kennedy was assassinated? Uh, I was in seventh grade science. Oh, so you were in, in school when it happened. Did they announce it over a lot? My of teacher, Lyle Miller, his name was, great teacher. He cried. It was very emotional. It was a shock, an absolute shock. Did you fully understand the, what was happening, or was it more of just all the adults were? It was just a shock. Yeah. Well, I was in seventh grade. Um, no, I couldn't grasp everything that was happening. But I mean, I knew what was happening, but I... And then I think, you know, I, I grasped more after I saw the, years later, the Zapruder tape. Then it was even more, more interesting and Shocking. Yeah. Was there? Uh, did but the, but then to see, I saw you know live the Harvey murder. Oh, really? Lee Harvey Oswald. 
Oswald murder, Harvey murder, Lee Harvey Oswald murder. That was a real shock. Yeah. Were you, so you were watching the TV when it happened? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Who was with you when you were watching? Well, we were at home. We were on uh, Thanksgiving break, you know. It was, so I don't know, one of my, in the family, I don't know, it was my parents, one of my parents, my, I don't know if it was my mom, my dad, or who. But that was a shock. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, this is just a, uh, it may just be a one word question, but did you or anyone you know at the time, did anyone have any theories about who killed him? Or was it, gen did generally everyone think it was Lee Harvey Oswald? At the time, we all thought it was Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, with my own experience, I highly doubt that he did it alone. Is there any party in particular you think was the... I have no idea. No. Yeah, There's too many parties. Yeah. I was just wondering, uh, would you like to explain all the photos that you brought with? Because uh, you've gone through a few of them, but is there any that you would really like to tell the story about? Oh, you know, uh, well, I was trying to wonder, like, you guys were asking me about if I knew anybody famous. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We did ask that. What is, who, what do you think is famous? What's famous to you guys? Whatever, whatever you uh, you deem it. Someone famous. made national news, maybe? That's the way I think, made national news. Everyone kind of heard about them one time, one or a few times. Or it could be a local celebrity. It's really <laughs> anyone. Anyway. Mayor of Milwaukee is definitely considered famous now when we study them. Oh, well, there is one, one particular guy other than the Lord Jesus that I think everybody knows, and I wrote to him, had a, had a close relationship years ago, but it fell off after a while. He's pretty famous, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say that's a very famous person. That's about the most famous guy I ever knew. <laughs> was that photo taken at a mall, or? You know where it was taken? At a department store. Oh, very cool. He made a trip to the department store. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, any more of those photos? Uh, Why, you want one? <laughs> no. Should I sign it? <laughs> no, I don't know. You wanted, uh, you wanted to know about, I don't know, my early life? Yeah, sure. Is, I see, is that a team photo right there? Yeah, it's a team photo. I, what did you want to know about my early life? Um, well, I guess couple more questions would be about the sports you played in high school and uh, you mentioned baseball and football. Um, just if it would be interesting to hear about those. Uh, Yeah. Well, I like baseball. I played Little League. Here's a Little League picture of me. Could you point yourself out there for us? No, nah, I'll let you guys point me out. <laughs> Here, you can take it. I bet you, I bet you Nathaniel can point me out. Hi, 
I I do not know. Come on, Nathaniel. Back row. Is it the back row middle? Next to the guy that's the real tall kid. Oh. Oh, to right there, the one to the to the left of the kid. If you're looking at the camera. Real tall, the real tall kid. Right. Yeah. Right yeah, that that's me. Oh, awesome. Now, which one is me here? There. Right there? Yeah. Were you guys a, a really good team? No. At the time? No. Perfect. No, I was, uh, I don't know where we placed, but we weren't a real good team. What position did you play? Outfield. Oh. Uh, did you enjoy playing the outfield, or was there a... I, I loved it. Do you, uh, do you remember the name of the team, the Little League? Well, you know what they used to be? They're the the Colts, Houston Astros, used originally were called the Houston Colts, Colt 45s. <laughs> and that's what that team was, the, the Colts. Oh, they were the Colt 45s. But then, they, after they built the Astrodome, they thought, oh, you know, we're going to call ourselves the Astros because yeah. of the space program. So... But that team was still the Colts. <laughs> they couldn't afford to get new uniforms. Later on, they got new uniforms. So this is your grandmother and me at, at our high school prom. Mm -hmm. uh, what were, yeah, what well, at least we're going to the high school prom. What were the dances like, the proms and everything? Oh, man, they were great. Man, you want to look at that? We could see it good. Okay. They were great. We, we always had, uh, in fact, high school every other week at the Bay, they had a band play. Like, you know, the kids that uh, played the guitars and they, you know, they had guitars, drums, and I mean, they were like, now they were, they were cover bands, they weren't original, and they'd play like the music of the day, and they probably knew 10 songs, but they were still good, they were decent. So every other week, there'd be some band playing in the gym. And then uh, the other, every other week there would be a, a uh, just like a record player yeah. it'd be a disc jockey but there wasn't really a disc jockey a DJ and would those be were those dances or were they more just uh, they were dances the they were dances wow every other week that's well every week one week it was called we we called them rec centers. One week would be the record records, and the next week would be the band. Oh, interesting! And these bands would play like for peanuts because they just wanted to get their names out. Yeah. And I mean, so there was one kid at the bay that was a great saxophone player. He was like in the band that the bay band and that, and so he played the saxophone with his band, and there was a. One, you know, to be a rhythm guitar and a bass guitar and a lead guitar and then a drummer and that kind of stuff. And, <clears throat> and he had a really good, he was part of a really good band, but then there'd be some, eh, but still we had a great time. Yeah. Do, you, do you remember any of the names of the bands that performed or did they not have? Yeah. I don't remember all of the names of the bands. There was, there was some bands, uh, I remember uh, there was one black band that would play, like we'd get for 
proms or Christmas formals or something like that. And it was Harry Scales and the Seven Sounds. And they were really good. They played like Motown stuff. Do you know Motown? Uh, Motown is for, Motown is, is Detroit. It's, it's, it, it's short for Motor City, it's Motown. And uh, so that, um, that was good stuff. Yeah. What are your uh, other photos that you had? The ones right there with the pictures? This? Yeah. Do I have to show you all that? If you want to. Yeah, only if you want to. Well, then you have to like read this. You have to take it and read it. I was interviewed by, in summer school, I think it was my freshman year, by the Journal Sentinel. Yeah. Oh, very cool. Could you uh, describe to the uh, people listening why you were interviewed and what the experience was like? I can't remember. Pupil to teacher relations. Uh, did you just help students and teachers get like more amicable with each other? Was there a problem beforehand, or no? They just wanted to know our opinions on stuff. Oh, yeah. Very interesting. <clears throat> it was just one of these things in the summertime, and a reporter came to the school, and and this was. Uh, in high school, yeah, I made the all-conference football team, so here's... And what, uh, what did you play in football? What center, center. Oh, okay. Was that a... Did you enjoy that, or was that... Oh, yeah, I really liked, I really liked, yeah, I, I played I, I played football from seventh grade on, but um, yeah, I was, uh, I really worked hard. I was kind of a marginal athlete and, and uh, my junior, my junior going into senior year, summer, I really, really worked hard, worked out hard because I wanted to be a, on the starting team in football. And uh, so that's what happened. I was fortunate enough to make all conference. Did you go on to play any sports in college, or? Yeah, I did at Cornell. I played center oh, okay. <laughs> on the freshman team. Awesome. But I transferred to Miami of Ohio because I just, I thought, you know, at, if I'm only good enough to play at Cornell, which was like, it wasn't even D3. It was like a level below D3, and I thought, it was like ripping, you know. <clears throat> or Beloit or something like that. Because that's who we played, like Ripon and Beloit. <laughs> and anyway, I thought, well, if I'm only at this level, and uh, you know, you could have fun at it, but, but uh, your grandmother was at Miami of Ohio, so I thought, I gotta transfer down to Miami of Ohio. You know, I'm not, I'm, what am I doing here, playing football? I'm not gonna be on the Packers, I'm not gonna make a nickel playing football, I'd probably bung up my knees and shoulders and ankles and whatever. Yeah. Well, uh, do you have any more questions? Uh, no, if you don't. Uh, do you have anything else that you would want to talk about before we wrap up? Any stories or? No. No? All, right. All good? That's it. Well, thank you for coming in. It was. Great, really interesting to hear your stories and 
we're looking forward to this being preserved forever. It'll be great to have this to look back on. And you're helping out with the Milwaukee History Mem Memory Project. Well, I, I will say actually on, uh, on uh, the people that you look, you know, up on your, uh, the, the famous people. Um, yeah, I've met some famous people. It's no, it's, I mean, in so, in so, so many words, I mean, it's like, I didn't want to really make a big deal out of, out of, uh, that I'm more impressed, to be honest with you, I'm more impressed with uh, some of the people who've, I've come across in life like, like your dad, for instance, you know, guys like that. And um, do you guys know Rick Breitish? Well, he was a teacher here. He's like, he's like your dad. And, and uh, those kind of people, like Mr. Parsons, you know, I'm, I, those, those are the kind of people I'm more impressed with than some of these people that, that uh, uh, you, you learn a lot uh, when, you know, even when you meet some of these famous people. I've, I've been to, I've been outside, I've been down to Palm Beach where Trump's at, where he lives, at Mar-a-Lago. I've been by Mar-a-Lago. I've been at the finest clubs in the world. Um, <clears throat> and I had breakfast or lunch with uh, a, a pretty impressive woman. Uh, down in Palm Beach, who you know, you, you through life you meet various people. Sometimes you look at them and you say, you see the good in them. You see the flaws in them and you say, well, what's so great about this person? And you learn that uh, people are people. They're not all so great. Uh, you know the DeLorean car? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, at Miami, uh, I knew about John DeLorean before he invented the DeLorean car because his nephew, I was very close, uh, well, I, I knew him, and your grandmother knew him very well, and he was a creep. I don't know if I should put that on the, he was a very nice young man. <clears throat> anyway, but it, you could kind of see how his, it runs in the family, too. And uh, he told us about his uncle, you know, my uncle is this at General Motors and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we thought, oh, okay. But this was before he invented the DeLorean car. And uh, <clears throat> you get to, I, I hope you guys have really good experiences in your life. You're very, you're young, you're getting out to uh, do things, and I hope you have some really good experiences as you go along. I know you will. Just be, you know, Look at, look at uh, uh, people and, and analyze people and <clears throat> make the right choices. 
when you when you uh, go through life and uh, I, I hope for the best for you guys thank you. that's it well thank you for coming in yes thank you again very great to have you talk about your experiences <laughs>